Hey everyone, welcome to my video on big, bold, beautiful bundle branch blocks. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to be discussing the pathophysiology of a bundle branch block, how to diagnose it, how to diagnose ischemia in bundle branch blocks, and we're going to go through a case to practice what we learned. So before we get started, um, it's very important to review this model that depicts how the electricity is sensed by the different leads in the EKG. So you guys can see the precordial leads, V1 through V6 in red, and the limb leads, AVR, AVL, 2, 3, AVF, and lead 1. So for bundle branch blocks, um, we're going to be looking at leads 1 and V6, which are to the left of the patient. So V6 is a precordial lead and lead V1 and lead 1 is a limb lead. And that's going to be to the patient's left, sensing electricity going towards the left of the heart. Uh, V1 is going to be towards the patient's right, sensing electricity moving towards the right of the heart. So you can see that in a left bundle branch block and in a right bundle branch, bundle branch block, the positive and negative deflections in each lead will be different. Um, so let's go through an example. So in this example, uh, this is a left bundle branch block. So you can see that the electricity in, in black travels on the right side of the heart fastest, and then it goes slowly towards the left side of the heart. So going slowly towards the left means that the leftward leads, lead one and lead V6, which are on the left side of this axis, are going to see a slow, big upwards positive deflection at the end of the QRS complex. So this is exactly what we're going to see in the future, in a future slide. So this is the diagnostic criteria. You guys can pause and read this on your own, but I like images better. So we're going to go look at some images of left and right bundle branch blocks. So this is a breakdown of how to diagnose different types, including right, left, and bundle branch blocks that do not fit the right and left criteria. So firstly, um, in a bundle branch block, you have to have a QRS wider than one half of a large box. In reality, it should be greater than 0.11 or 0.12 um, 12 seconds. So that's approximately half of a large box, which is 0.2 seconds. Um, for a right bundle branch block, you guys are going to see a Moro pattern, right? So if you look at V1, um, the way that you do it is you look at leads V1 and then V6, right? So V1 is going to look like an M. V6 is going to look like a, a W, meaning that the positive deflection will be in lead 1. That's going to be an M. And a negative deflection, a wide terminal negative deflection, will be in lead V6, which is going to be the W in Moro. And then you're going to check that this is the case with lead one, because remember one and V6 are both towards the left side of the heart. So you should see similar deflections, similar Ws to make it a right bundle branch block. Uh, in a left bundle branch block, you'll see the opposite pattern. So you'll see the William pattern. So you start with V1 and it should be a W and then you continue spelling William until you get to lead V6, which should be an M. So the way I do it is W, I, L, so I'm looking for a left bundle branch block. And then I come up across an M, so an upward deflection in lead V6. So that should be a left bundle branch block. So I look at lead one to confirm, and I see that is correct. So there is an M in V6 and an M in lead one. So this is a left bundle branch block. So if this pattern does not exist. So if you have the beginning of a uh, William pattern of a left bundle branch block pattern, but this V6 lead does not have a, a clear positive deflection, and same thing with lead V1, if, v, if, if lead one doesn't match V6, then we call it intraventricular conduction defect or conduction delay, uh, which just doesn't fit the right bundle or left bundle um, branch block pattern. So what are normal ST changes in bundle branch blocks? So you guys can see that a normal change in the ST segment is actually a discordant change. So if we look in these previous um, pictures, in the William pattern, if the W is going down, 
the ST segment is going to be going up. And the same thing, if the M is going up, the ST segment is going to be going down. And these are normal appearances of ST segments and T waves in a normal bundle, bundle branch block. So this is depicted in this diagram here. If you see a positive QRS deflection, you'll see a negative ST segment and T wave. And the same thing, if you see a negative QRS deflection, you'll see a positive ST segment and T wave. So let's take a look at this EKG. You guys can pause the video and see if you can diagnose this bundle branch block. So um, the first thing you'll notice is that the QRS segment is definitely bigger than um, half of a large box. It's around one and a half large boxes. So this meets the first criteria for bundle branch block. And the second criteria for bundle branch block is that it's a supraventricular rhythm. So you guys can see that there's P waves. There's P waves here, there's P waves here, there's P waves here before every QRS. So that means that it is a sinus rhythm and it originates above the ventricles. So it's not VTAC or VFib. Um, so let's take a look at this QRS pattern in V1 and continue spelling until we get to V6. So this looks like it's an M and lead V1. And then we spell M, R-O. So we're looking for an R and then a W. So this is a little bit difficult, but you can see that there is a wide terminal W here. It looks like this, there, this positive deflection should mean that it's not a W, but the actual widest part of the QRS is this um, S wave. That's wide and large. So this is an M to a W, so it should be a right bundle branch block. Let's confirm by looking at V1, uh, at lead one, if it matches V6, and it does match. We see the W here, the big S wave. So this is a right bundle branch block. And you can also check the ST segments. And we say a big positive deflection means a negative um, T and, and ST segment. And this is correct. The negative deflection here leads to a positive T and ST segment here. So this is a normal, normal ST segment. And I'm not concerned for ischemia here. Let's look at the second EKG. Pause this video and try to diagnose this pattern. Okay, let's go over it. So you can see the first thing is, is the QRS greater than half a large box? It is. Um, the QRS is going to be right here. This is a good example of a QRS. And you can see that it's around half a large box, if not a little bit greater. So that's perfect. And it is a superventricular rhythm. You can see there's P waves before every QRS. There's P waves. There's P waves here before every QRS. And let's try to diagnose it using our um, William and Morrow memory hook. So in lead V1, you can see that it looks a little bit confusing, but this right here is an ST segment, is a T wave and ST segment. So this is the QRS, which is mostly going downwards. So that's a W and we keep spelling until we get to William. So we're looking for a left, oh, my bad. We're looking for a left bundle branch pattern. So W, I, L, and then we're looking for an M at the end, which is what we see a huge wide upward QRS deflection in V6. So we check with lead one and it's also wide and upwards. So this is a left bundle branch block. The ST segments are going the opposite way of the deflection. So you can see the ST here is going downwards and the ST here is going upwards, which is opposite the QRS deflection. So this is not concerning for ischemia. So what would be concerning for ischemia is the lack of this upward and downwards discordance between the QRS and the T wave. So you can see here in these three boxes, these are all examples of concordant, inappropriately concordant T waves to the QRS. So this QRS is going up and the T wave is concordant with this QRS and lead one. And the same thing in lead V1, you can see this QRS is going down and the T wave is concordant with, with the QRS, inappropriately so. And the same thing with V6. So these are all changes that are 
indicative of potential ischemia. Um, there's one interesting caveat here, which is in left bundle branch blocks, there's the Scarbosa criteria and the modified Smith Scarbosa criteria, which we will look at to determine if there are ischemic changes in the setting of a left bundle branch block. But for interventricular conduction delay or condu conduction defect, um, you have to first check a previous EKG. And if you see these patterns here and changes from a previous EKG, you will consider this a myocardial infarction until proven otherwise. Meaning you need to have three things to diagnose an MI. You have to have EKG changes, troponins, and active chest pain that's ideally typical. So if you have the more things out of those three that you have, the more likely that this is a, an occlusive lesion in the coronary artery, and this patient needs to go to the cath lab. And the same thing with the right bundle branch block. If you see ischemic changes, any of these boxes present in V1, V6, or lead one, you have to look at a previous EKG, and if the patient is experiencing chest pain or has positive troponins, I would urge the cardiologist to, to take them to the, to the catheterization lab. Um, another sign of ischemia I didn't mention is a Q wave in lead V6 in a right bundle branch block pattern. So if there's a Q wave over here, a large negative deflection in the QRS, beginning of the QRS, that is indicative of new or old ischemia. And the other things here we already spoke about in the last slide. So these, this is the Scarbosa criteria and modified Smith criteria is here as well. You can pause and read this on your own, but I prefer pictures. Um, this is from Life in the Fast Lane. So you guys can see that there are three different images that indicate ischemia according to the Scarbosa criteria. So you can have ST elevation in a concordant QRS and ST segment. You can have ST elevation in a discordant QRS and ST segment that's above five millimeters. Um, sorry, not five millimeters, but above 25% of the above 25% of the negative QRS deflection. So this one is a tricky one. If you have a QRS that's very large and a seemingly large ST segment elevation in the discordant T wave, then um, you can diagnose a ischemic change based on the Scarbosa criteria. Also, an ST depression, an ST depression that is concordant to the QRS segment will be um, an ischemic change if it's above one millimeter. And the same thing with the ST elevation, it has to be above one millimeter, that's concordant. All right, so let's go through a case together. We have a 55-year-old woman with idiopathic cardiomyopathy and biventricular failure with a previous ejection fraction of 15%. She presents with sudden onset severe substernal chest pain. And you see in previous records that a coronary angiogram did not show significant coronary atherosclerosis. And that angiogram was done within the past few months. And this is the EKG that you see on arrival. So pause this video and let's try to diagnose um, what this EKG is. And let's go over it together. So we look at lead V1, and we see a large negative deflection. So that's a W. Um, we continue spelling William, and we expect to see a positive deflection V6, which we do see. So this is a left bundle branch block um, because the QRS is widened, and there's P waves before every QRS. So it's a supraventricular rhythm. Um, and we look at lead 1 to check and see if this upward deflection is present, and it is. So it's a little bit confusing here, but these are actually the P waves. If you track the QRS segments down, you can see this is clearly a QRS. This is clearly a QRS, and this is a P wave. And it is upgoing. The QRS is upgoing. So we have a left bundle branch block. And what do you guys think about this, um, this EKG? So one thing that jumps out to me right away is you can see that um, the QRS over here doesn't have a negatively discordant ST segment and T wave. So to me, this looks like a sign of potential ischemia. But without looking at a 
a previous EKG, it's hard to, to make this distinction. And we can also look for Scarbosa criteria. For example, in lead V4, you can argue this might be an ST elevation, but this QRS segment is very large. It's almost three full boxes and this two, I would say two millimeter elevation from where the QRS begins right here, it's not large enough to, to indicate a positive Scarbosa criteria finding. And the same thing with this QRS to ST segment over here, you can see it maybe is three millimeters elevated. So I would not call this um, a positive EKG for ischemia. However, we can look at the previous one and what do we see here? If we look at V6, we can see that um, there's a clear ST segment um, discordance between the QRS and the ST segment in V6. And to me, this is indicative that there is a clear ST segment change. And especially because this is an indication of new or old ischemia, I would be very highly concerned and I would immediately um, call the cardiologists and activate a STEMI code, especially in a patient with active chest pain while I'm waiting for the troponins to, to come back. So let's compare um, from the previous EKG, the one um, that we have on file for the patient and the EKG now, and you can see that the same thing is in lead one. So in the previous EKG, I know it says lead two over here, but it's actually because there was a limb lead reversal, which we're going to go over on the next slide. So if you look at um, leads two and leads one in the previous EKG, they match their opposite to leads two and leads one in the EKG on arrival. So one of these EKGs has a limb lead reversal, which is beyond the scope of this talk, but I will have a slide on that very shortly. So if we compare lead one, the lead ones, um, the EKG now does not have, remember this is the QRS, the second bump here is the QRS and this is the P wave. This QRS does not have a negative deflection and the same thing with V6, there is no negative deflection um, for the T wave. There's only a positive QRS and then a flat line. And in the previous EKG, there's a clear positive QRS and then a negative deflection, clear positive QRS and a negative deflection. So this is to me an ischemic change. Um, and then this is from um, Dr. Smith's EKG blog and this Dr. Grauer left a, a comment on this EKG lead reversal. And this is how you actually diagnose it. If you guys have extra time, you can feel free to read, read this. Um, now the case continues. The cardiologist comes down and they're deciding whether or not to take this patient to cath lab. The cardiologist doesn't really think this is an MI, but the, the resident that's taking care of this patient in the emergency room does. And ultimately the, the attending physician does not send this patient to cath lab based on these small EKG changes. And in this EKG, if you guys can notice any kind of changes, shout them out and we'll go over it in a couple seconds. So what jumps out to me in this EKG is again, um, this T wave is now no longer even flat. It's a little bit going upward. So that to me is a little concerning. And you can see in lead one, there are some, I wouldn't, there actually, I wouldn't really call these depressions, but maybe the development of depressions that look different from previous EKGs. But in lead three and AVF, you can definitely see some elevations happening here. Oh, excuse me. So in lead three and AVF, and in AVL especially, you can see a depression in AVL, and three and AVF have some elevations that are developing and new from previous EKG, which is here. You can see three and AVF don't really have the same pattern in AVL as well. Maybe some minimal depressions, but the T wave looks looks nice and neat, whereas here, you can see the T wave and the ST segment have this divot in them. There's this divot here. So the depression does not look like it used to and the elevation does not look nice and neat like it used to before. So we're comparing leads three and leads AVL so you guys can see even closer that there's now 
a different morphology in the ST segment and a different morphology in the ST segment here from previous. And again, let's look at the Scarbosa criteria. So this QRS depression, um, this QRS negative deflection is maybe around one large box or five small boxes. And this elevation is around three, around three small boxes. So three over five is around 60%. So this meets one of the Scarbosa criteria. And you can say this is indicative of ischemia. So if we look at this diagram again, this elevation has to be less than 25%, less than 25% um, to not meet Scarabosa criteria. And if it's above 25%, then it does meet Scarabosa criteria. Um, then this patient's pain continues and EK, repeat EKG at 92 minutes shows even worse ST depressions and AVF and lead three and elevations in AVL. And same thing in 105 minutes. Finally, the patient's troponins come back positive and this patient is taken to cath lab and they find that there's 100% occlusion of the left circum circumflex of two marginal two artery. Um, and it's suspicious for an extra coronary source of thrombus um, because remember this patient's cath was negative in previous months. So a transesophageal echo was performed and a thrombus was found in the left atrial appendage, which is probably the source of the embolus and occlusion, which is really exciting because we think, um, you know, previous negative cath, the EKG is a bundle branch block. So we can't really say that it's a, a clear MI because bundle branches are hard to diagnose, but you can see here, even subtle changes that are new are indicative of ischemia until proven otherwise. So this patient should have been taken to cath lab earlier. And this is the EKG after cath lab. And you can see if we check the bundle branch pattern, we can see a W. We expect to see a, a left bundle branch with an M pattern in V6. And we see an M and that's confirmed with lead one, which we see an M in. And you can see that the ST segments are appropriately discordant here. So appropriately discordant ST segments. So um, I would say that this is an EKG that is no longer indicative of ischemic changes. And thank you guys very much for listening. And I hope you learned something.